Yeah. Oh, well, so thank you for joining us again today, Liz, to sort of wrap up something that we started talking about earlier. And um, everyone, I'm Sarah Hannawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse. Liz, you want to introduce yourself and also maybe not just your current role, but your previous role to so that folks understand the deep expertise you're bringing here. Sure. So hi, everybody. I'm Liz Cates. I am the assistant head uh, for school partnerships at One Schoolhouse. I've been here on the team for uh, just over three years, and I started out as our director of school and student support. So what that meant is that for the bulk of my time working with the team, um, I've been responsible for managing student progress and performance. Um, and that means everything from getting students up and running in our courses um, to troubleshooting when students have a hard time, to managing concussion plans, um, to um, working with school advisors to support students in crisis. Um, you know, there's always something that came across my desk that was new, but by the end of my time in that role, I had seen the vast majority of it. Um, and so it's been really rewarding for me over the past six months to be able to share those experiences with schools um, who are figuring out the ins and outs of supporting students when they can't um, walk down the hall and um, I say, and only half joking, lie and wait for them outside pre-calc. Um, oh. It's not even joking. I have done it many a time. <laughs> and I'm sure everybody here can identify with that too. And in fact, those of you who are here in the chat, feel free to share any strategies you have used for lying in wait and trying to be subtle about it because, you know, kids in there like, who is she looking for? Um, so we're going to use the Q&A today for questions, but in the meantime, we, you and I spoke about some things that we definitely wanted to address. And one is that this is a really specific time of year for schools. And we, I just happen to know that Liz is coming to us from something called the watch list meeting. And I bet you guys at your school have something similar. Um, the meeting where you get together and you're you're at this magic moment in the year. So talk a little bit about that magic moment. Sure, so the magic moment is a little different when you're online and that's because two things um, sort of collide in the, at the start of the year um, in an online program. Um, I think of it kind of like a confluence of two rivers. So the first is the novelty effect, which um, I'm sure we can all think of lots of novelty effects in our lives when we get something new or like a new ingredient in the kitchen or, um, or your kids new got workout new clothes, new workout <laughs> clothes, whatever. Um, so the novelty effect when you're dealing with technology is that a new tool is extremely effective when you start to use it. Um, in the classroom, if you've ever sort of like instituted a new system or a new, um, you know, or like whether it's, um, I, I think about like, you know, formative assessment tools online, like the first couple weeks when you use that, they're incredibly effective. And they're effective because of the, what the tool itself does, but they're more effective because they're new. The thing is, is that everything new stops being new. Um, and the novelty effect typically lasts somewhere between two and four weeks um, in our experience. That may be different based on the tools that you've used or, you know, how many, you know, how many little, how gamified the tool is or one schoolhouse, our LMS isn't very gamified. Let's be honest. It just sort of does its job. Um, we don't badge and give stickers and play music. Like you check it off and you see the check mark. Um, so that novelty effect lasts two to four weeks. Here's the thing. When you think about how you plan a curriculum, those first two to four weeks, that's when you're getting everybody used to going. Like, it's a little bit easier. You're doing some review work because you want to build confidence and you also want to assess where your students are. You're teaching them the routines of what you're doing. How do I navigate the classroom? How do I meet my teacher's expectations? What's the difference between being a 10th grader from being a ninth grader? Um, and then when we get all those things under, you know, when our students sort of build a basic level of confidence there, then we actually ramp up the difficulty in the content. Then we say, okay, new material more challenging. Let's get going. 
in the online world that, okay, let's get going. Let's ramp up the challenge level happens at exactly the same. So that goes up at the same time, the novelty effect wears off. And mm -hmm. so for students who are, who may be vulnerable or for students who are managing a lot of change, like learning from home instead of learning in school or going back and forth in a hybrid program, what happens when the, the novelty effect misaligns with the ramping up of the challenge is that you uncover the students who are struggling. Um, I think of it, I'm gonna mix my metaphors all over the place here, so just roll with me. I think of it kind of like low tide, like that, like the, that happens and the tide goes out and you see all of the little sea creatures right there who were holding on who you had no idea were there. Um, and that's where we are typically at this point. Now I know we've got some people on here from the South who have been in school for six weeks and some people from the Northeast who may be just in their third week of school. So we're all over the place. You may have already seen this happening. It may be happening right now or you may be biting your nails going, uh oh, is that gonna happen to me? Um, but this is the time when we're gonna surface those students. And, hmm. and the other thing that's tricky to know is that when you take students and you put them in a novel environment, you also see some regression. So that students who might be really competent in school when you're on campus may not be quite as competent when you're online or in a hybrid environment. We, we actually at one schoolhouse tend to factor in, in terms of academic maturity, about a year to 18 months of regression in the first quarter. So that's interesting. Um, and I've heard you talk about regression before. And in fact, you and Lisa Demore talk about that some in your course that you do for us. Mm -hmm. This idea that kids in, or adults too, right? If you're in situations that are traumatic, there's a regression. So now we've got kids who are possibly learning in modalities that are new to them. Mm -hmm. And they're dealing with you know, that place that is supposed to be predictable and safe and secure for me. So we've got two elements that could be imposing regression. In your experience, is that a regression that lasts sort of the year or does it, is it something that kids work through and then they go back to where they are? What's, what's the trajectory? Yeah, it's usually temporary. Um, what we find is that kids who are really strong on campus tend to be strong online and kids who are kids who struggle on campus tend to struggle online. That's not always true, but nine times out of 10, when I picked up the phone and I called the school and I said, we're really worried about this student, the answer I got was like, yep, so are we. Um, and the 10th time it was like, really? That kid? So, so what we tend to see is that, um, and this is true especially for the kind of students who are in independent schools, they are very good at doing school. And I make that distinction between doing school and, um, and, and, and the academic work. Like they're very good at managing their time and pulling information. Um, and so part of what sometimes happens when you put them in a novel environment, whether it's online, hybrid, new LMS, is that all of a sudden the strategies that they had don't work. And so part of the reason why the regression happens is it's kind of like, I thought I knew how to do this. And so you need to do a little bit of reassurance um, and you need to remind them that they do know what they're doing and that they may need to build in some new strategies as well. And so what the way that we sort of think of it is it's like one step back, two steps forward. You go back, but you're going to, what you're actually going to learn is going to build your resilience and build your academic maturity. Um, but in all honesty, we'd expect that to be intensified this year. There's just too much going on. So when you encounter a student who is, you know, one of those who the, the tide going out reveals and you realize that there's some things going on, um, what are some strategies that you support teachers in providing that help those students maybe de-regress, I guess, or help them get back to that level of functioning that they were at previously? Yep. Let me, I notice a question here in the chat and I just want to answer that quickly, which was the question was, given that students were, that the vast majority of students were remote last year, would we still expect a novelty effect now? And the answer is yes and no. 
Um, for many schools, even if they're remote now, the program looks really different than it did last year because last year we were in crisis distance learning. Um, and this year we've had planning and we've had preparation. And so what most students are encountering is different. There's also, there's always a novelty effect at the beginning of the year, right? Like kids show up ready to go. Like they're kind new of like box, new planner, like exactly. this is the year I put it all in. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and also like even for our kids who struggle with things like executive functioning or have a learning profile that may not be a natural fit for the way we teach, like for the most part, they come back going, I'm ready. I'm going to try it. Um, and so, so I would not expect it to be as strong as if we hadn't been remote in the spring, but I'd still expect it, quite frankly. Okay, so back to that question about like, how do we support those kids when, when the tide goes out and we see that they are struggling? So the first thing is, um, I'm gonna quote from Lisa Damore again, relationship, relationship, relationship. When a student is struggling, the first thing you do is you build the student-teacher relationship because the relationship between the student and teacher is as important, if not more important, than it is on campus. So make sure that, you're, that that teacher is reaching out. The face-to-face -face video chat is the most powerful tool your teachers have, hands down. Just like sitting down with a student one-on-one -on -one is the most powerful thing you can do as a teacher because you can assess what's going on. You can get students to be honest and straightforward in a different way. You can, you can correct in real time. So go to the face-to-face -face video meeting as quickly as you can. That's the first thing. Um, is a phone call, hang on, I just wanna ask a question. Is a phone call an okay substitute? It, sure. Anything is better than nothing. Like if you can video that, that is the best also because then you can screen share. And if the kid's running into a hard time, like you can actually see what's going on. But um, the, the more that a student can experience your warmth, and I don't know a teacher who's not warm. Nobody gets into this job because they don't like students. Um, but the more they can experience that and the more you can, you can hear them, and you can hear not just what they're saying, but also um, I think of it as the difference between music and lyrics in a song. Like they might be telling you something, but the melody is gonna give you some really important information. And you'll get that through tone and you'll get that through body language. So the more information you can get, the better you are. So the first thing is build connection. Um, the second thing is break it down is, um, is make it, make it seem manageable. Um, and that may mean breaking complicated projects down into tasks and chunks. It may mean giving students organizational strategies, but you want them to leave that meeting feeling like I have a plan to move forward. Um, and the third thing is to monitor them. And I don't mean that in a creepy big brother way. I mean, it's pay really close attention to that student. If you notice that after you came up with a plan, they're not meeting it, get on that. You know, take a preview there, even if you can't get to their grading for a few days, because I know I, that was sometimes my experience as a teacher, just preview it, just scan it through, even if you can't give it the time it needs. Just make sure that you're monitoring that. It'll make, it'll make a big difference to how quickly you can respond. And fast response for a student is one way you can express caring. I think that's a really good point because as the year goes on, we do get to that time where teachers have 70 term papers and, and that sort of thing. And sometimes we as schools will say, you know, 24 hours, even if it's just a quick got your message getting back to you. But for these first first times, and particularly if a student's struggling, faster than that is better. Yep. And and also, yeah. And that doesn't mean that you should be on your email at 10 o'clock. I'm a big fan of teachers saying to students, hey, I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. And if you email me after 930, you'll hear from me tomorrow morning. That's a healthy boundary. And the predictability of that, so students know you're not ignoring them. They're like, oh, okay. Maybe frustrating, but at least they know. And they know not to wait up till 1130 hoping for that response. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a good point. 
Um, so what are signs besides sort of the obvious ones, right? So flunking your first three quizzes, clear signs, something's going on, let's, let's talk to this student. But what are some signs, and I'm thinking particularly about this hybrid world where we don't have, maybe kids are in schools on some days or some kids are on campus and others are at home. So, and so we don't necessarily see all of a student's face anymore. So their teachers are really good at reading kids and reading a room really fast. What are some signs that teachers can look for now that, hey, I, I need that one-on-one -on -one call with this student? Yep. So the big category is avoidance. Um, the, the, what that, that's like the, if that's the, the category, here's what those behaviors look like. Not responding to your teacher's emails. That is a huge, huge red flag for us um, because they're not responding because, well, sometimes they're not responding because they don't understand email etiquette and that's its own issue. But if, if you know that they know how to do that and they're not responding, what they are telling you is that they are intensely uncomfortable about something that's going on in your class. So they are trying to avoid that uncomfortable feeling um, and that's why they're avoiding you because your class is making them uncomfortable. So you're getting um, ghosted essentially. What? Well, sorry, I didn't hear. Just getting ghosted, saying. as my kids would say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, don't let them ghost you. Um, a, if there is a change in a student's voice in what they're writing. So I think about one of our teachers who, um, who sent me, when I was working in student support, who sent me a message and say, you know, she's still getting all of her work done, but she used to write these beautiful, like, you know, really thoughtful, supported paragraphs. And now I'm just getting three or four sentences and, and it's checking the boxes, but something's, something's not the same. And I called the school and I said, we're just wondering about, about this student. Is she okay? And they said, how did you know? She's going through a massive crisis. Um, and so, so it was the teacher's instinct, like the grade stayed the same, but something was different. So pay attention to those things. Um, missing assignments. Um, one, a missing assignment, one, not a big deal. Two, do something. Like in the classroom, um, and some of you have been on webinars with me before, I've heard me say this. In a classroom, it's really responsible to wait and give a student a chance to recover on their own. Online, students go downhill a lot faster than they do in person, in part because avoidance is so much more effective. Like, even if they're avoiding your class, they still have to show up and walk in and sit with you for 45 to 90 minutes here online, they just don't log in. Um, so that means that you can avoid a lot more effectively. So if you're noticing two or more, jump into. Okay, that's a great question. And you, you brought up grades, so I'm gonna bring up grades. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you some questions about uh -oh. grades. I know, well, so next week we have, um, a guest with us who's going to talk about college admissions and we were having a preliminary conversation and she brought up that grades are incredibly complicated right now um, for students. So how do we set up grades that allow for students to to be struggling so that we don't have penalties that that accumulate or I'm not sure I know exactly how to put this question but can you um, elaborate a little bit on grade versus student support versus, you know, what does it all look like at the end of the year? Yeah, are we talking about sort of like how you give them a ladder out of the hole? Yeah. Yeah, um, okay, so I think it's, the first thing is for schools to be really aware of how they use grades. Some of our schools use grades for feedback. Others give feedback other ways and grades do other jobs for things like ranking and, um, and you know, and, um, and tracking. So it's really important to be aware of how your school uses grades. Um, the second thing is to, is to also be, make sure that students are getting feedback. Um, some of our students are very good at interpreting numbers and letter grades as feedback and others have a really hard time with it. Um, I think the thing that's so important when you're thinking about it from a student support perspective um, is that because we know that it's easier for students to go downhill because avoidance works differently in an online or hybrid space, 
um, that there needs to be a way for them to come back. Um, we've gone back and forth a lot on, um, I'll talk about this in terms of a late policy at one schoolhouse about what that means. Um, the first thing is that what we realized is that having a uniform uh, policy for lateness for us was an equity issue to have it across classes. Um, that may be the case in your school and it may not. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that the reason why we had a late policy was because we feel that building academic maturity and submitting work on time is a key competency of our program that we that work coming in at the time it's 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 due is essential to the skills that we are trying to teach and so that's why we built in a penalty for lateness um, now that may be different at your school there are lots of good reasons to have the policy we have and lots of good reasons to have a different policy this is not Things like late policy and grading and redo um, and no rescue, all of those are deeply tied to your school culture. And right. so, so what I am not saying is that this is the one you should do, but I can tell you about how we landed where we did. So what we decided was that, um, that we were going to require to say that any work that came in after the due date would have a penalty for lateness unless it was cleared with the director of student support. And so when, when I was in that role, that was me. Um, and that we would give full credit extensions only in the case of emergency or extenuating circumstances. So what that meant was you had a family emergency and your grandfather was ill and your parents had to go. And so you had to go pick up your, your little siblings from school and supervise their homework and get them to bed and you couldn't do it. That counts. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's tech week for the play, which you've known about for, for seven weeks and you wanna know if you can turn the work in afterwards. We're gonna say, you have two choices. We'll help you put together a plan to turn it in before your crunch time, and that's for full credit, or you can turn it in after for, for, with that late penalty. And the reason why we did that is because what we saw time and time again, is that for students who knew that they were going to have a crunch time, the ones who completed their work ahead of time, and then were able to rejoin the class at the same place, had much better long-term outcomes than the students who came back from that time away from their course with a backlog. And so we said, we want our policy to drive students to the behavior that helps them succeed. And so, when it comes to grading, I think that's the most important thing. Whatever that behavior is in your community, and it may be different from the one ours is, and that's fine, but the policies and the penalties you have need to drive students towards the behaviors and habits of mind that lead to success. So I think that's such a huge point, and I love the way that you explain sort of where that comes from and the conversations that happen, because I think way too often, we sort of have a penalty because we always have or we don't have one because you know and, and we haven't been so intentional about it we're gonna we're gonna open this up for questions and i'm gonna ask you a question to get started but please if you've got questions you can um, put them in the chat or in the q a and so can, we've talked a little bit about this but are there any guardrails that we missed uh, and so by guardrails things that we put up to to protect students yeah, so that you don't need too much of a ladder. Because I think all schools, right, we've all got ladders out of the hole. If a kid gets, you know, really sideways, we don't want that second quarter catastrophe to still be playing out in fourth quarter. Yeah. Um, so, some, there are, so one of the things that we do is we say, um, there are some assignments that you're not going to make up. So things like a discussion board where you really needed to be in the moment and responding to classmates and to get people to respond to you. Just be like, you know what? Sometimes we drop those. Sometimes we say, you know what? We're just taking those out of the equation. We're going to excuse you. Sometimes we also say to students um, that, you know what? Make up only the work that's essential. There's still going to be a penalty for the work that you missed, but don't spend your time here. And so I think that, that um, 
that knowing what's really essential and knowing what is important to do in the moment when it's assigned and what still retains its efficacy, even when you're doing it after the due date is really important because not every assignment does. And don't make kids waste their time jumping through the hoop if the goal is to get them caught up with the class. Such a good point. And I think that ties back to, to what you had mentioned earlier about students' capacity to see a grade as feedback and that some can and some can't. And I'm thinking in particular, um, you know, advanced courses with reading quizzes, right? Did you read? And kids see that as a, did my eyes go over the page? And sometimes some students really need that careful one-on-one, -on -one, this is how you read for information in this course. And this is what your notes from the reading should look like. And other kids look at their first grade of 50 and go, oh, I gotta slow down and take some notes while I read. And they, boom, they're good. So, you know, and teachers know that. Yeah. They know that those differences exist. I uh, Question. Yes, go, go, question. <laughs> All right. So this is a question that says, our system for students, hang on, I'm going to sort of summarize here a little bit. So our system is very teacher centered. Each teacher is very organized with a calendar or a Word document about what's due in their class, but the kids are struggling it's too late for an LMS, right? So nobody's buying an LMS and putting it in by October 1st. So, oh, so that should be failed. <laughs> <laughs> but what's some advice that you can have for an academic leader in the school who is realizing suddenly that kids are having six, seven systems to navigate mm -hmm. to make their own? Yep. Academic. So the first thing to know is that when we're all on campus operating as usual, kids are aggregating. That's what the planner does, right? That's your good old fashioned, yep, we both have a paper planner, you're aggregating. Like, here's where I write down my math homework, here's where I write down my history homework. Um, so give kids systems for aggregation. Um, so I think I mentioned I have, I have, two, um, I have two early middle school students. Um, and they were sent home, they got their whole box of materials and there was a planner in there. And they're like, why am I using this? Um, if you don't explain to kids the different systems that they can use for aggregation and you don't remind them that they need them in the online space, they may not use them because kids are masters at efficiency, even when efficiency works against them. They're always looking for the, almost always looking for the fastest way out. If I don't, if you didn't tell me to do this, do I need to do it? And then, you know, sometimes we have the kids who are like, you didn't tell me to do this, so I did this three times. Um, we can talk about them another day. Um, so make sure that students understand how to aggregate, whether that is on a spreadsheet, whether that's on a paper planner, whether um, that's a digital calendar, like a Google calendar or a Microsoft calendar. Um, be explicit with students that that is a way to manage it. And, um, and, and it's, it's really important to know that when you are teaching in a novel environment, as we all are, even if we did it last spring, it is still novel to us. Um, the things that we assume carry, that are clear to us that carry over may not be clear to our students. And so the more we can be explicit, and this is true no matter what you're talking about, the more you can be explicit, this is, this is a skill, this is practice, this is assessment, this is an assignment. The more you can be explicit, the more students will pull on the skills that they used in your classroom every day. So, you know, when you say that, I also think that there is, um, the, the question was about one system where there's not an LMS. I think kids in a school that does use a unified LMS can still benefit from, you know, the planner, the reminders so that their phone chimes when they're supposed to start doing something or head into a certain Zoom. And I, and I gotta tell you, I still like the wall calendar. We've got one on the kitchen <laughs> wall. Like our kitchen is not very pretty because we are scribbling all over the place on that, but it is, it it's, is remarkably helpful. Yeah, manipulating information helps you learn and remember it. So if you're, even if you're copying something down, you're encoding it in a different way. So sometimes, um, 
you know, my wife's father was a submariner and the big lesson that I learned from him is you always want redundant systems <laughs> um, because you need a second system if your first one goes out when you're underwater. Um, and so redundant systems, sometimes they're a duplication of effort, but the other thing that they do is they help you preview problems and they help you avoid crisis. And so, so talking with students about, you know, even if you're just copying it down and putting it in the order that you're going to do it, you are still making meaning. And when you make meaning of something, you remember it, you encode it, you make connections, and you understand it. And so, so I just, Sarah, I love what you said, like, you know, it's still useful because having somebody do it for you, it's like, what is it? It's like, listen, and I, you know, listen, and I learn, do, and I remember. Right. That's still true. <laughs> you know what? I love that. And I want to go back to your original quote. I want to make sure I write. Manipulation makes. Oh, uh, uh, when you manipulate information, you make meaning from it. Ah. Awesome. So I am going to close on that because we are at the end of our time. Um, you did make me think of students who write things in their planner and then never have to look at it again because by writing it in their planner, that's all they needed to do, but they would never skip writing it. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. We are glad to have you here. We'll be back next week. Um, check out our website for a list of upcoming webinars and we're glad to have you here. It's great Bye -bye. to see you guys. Thank you, Liz. Bye-bye.